Hi, I'm Chris Group, and this is Dr. Larry Group. Hi. And welcome to the Evidence Based Esthetician. We are going to be talking about two different subjects today. The first one being microdermabrasion and some other types of exfoliation. And then we are going to um, be talking about multi level marketing and how it relates to skincare. Yeah, so let's get started with microdermabrasion a little bit. Chris, what's the back? What is microdermabrasion and how does it work? And well, there's okay, so microdermabrasion is a procedure that's been around for quite some time, and it's basically uh, an exfoliation of the stratum corneum or the outer layer of the uh, epidermis. And it can be done in different methods. It can be done with a machine that uses crystals and a vacuum, it can be done with a machine that um, uses like a, a diamond uh, dust on the um, tip. It, there are things called hydrofacials and things called silk pills, so some that use um, water or okay. saline. Um, and then there's also dermophiles, which are little devices that almost look like a, um, a mirror that would go into the mouth for a dentist, but it's got diamond dust on it. And then we also have dermaplaning. So there's lots of different ways to do exfoliation. And one of the first ones with a machine was um, microdermabrasion. So basically what you're trying to do is exfoliate the top of the stratum corneum um, to reveal brighter and hopefully younger looking skin. Um, and it's a very popular treatment. Not quite as popular um, a straight microdermabrasion as it was maybe 12, 15 years ago, but it is still a very popular procedure. Have you done microdermabrasion with clients? And oh, yeah. How, when did you start doing that? Uh, we started actually in school. So um, we had microderm in our school. Uh, that was 2002. Um, so we're just doing a, a, me a mechanical exfoliation. What kind of machine did you have? Did you have the, the time where the, the dust is bonded to the diamond, or did you actually have the type that sprays no, like aluminum the, the oxide? aluminum oxide crystals, okay. um, which does a very nice exfoliation, but sometimes when I use it in conjunction with like a photofacial or things like that, it's a more difficult to use because it's hard to get the aluminum oxide crystals off the skin before the photofacial. So this is a, a treatment that we can do in combination with other treatments. So you'll hear things like a micro peel, which would be a microdermabrasion with a chemical peel, um, or you'll do microdermabrasion before a photofacial, or maybe microderm before hair reduction. Why, why would you do that? Um, sometimes when you're trying to, I, I call it stubborn pigment, so sometimes if I'm trying to get some lighter pigment um, uh, targeted on a client's face. I feel that if I can get that stratum corneum taken off or a portion of it taken off, I'm going to get a better penetration of the light and I'm going to get a more aggressive treatment. How about the better penetration of any sort of chemical agent? Does that work as well, do you think? Absolutely. Okay. Um, if you can remove part or most of the stratum corneum, you are going to get more product penetration because it doesn't have that barrier to go through. Okay. So the magic of filming, I actually had a, the microdermabrasion you're about to see done about an hour ago. So, and this is what I look like afterwards. I had it done on my cheeks and my forehead. So this is about post. Uh, but let's talk a little bit more about the uh, how the procedure works here. Okay, so um, what we're showing in this slide is basically you're running this, looks like a like a pen, I yeah, guess? Yeah, it looks like a marker. Okay, and you're just running that over the skin, and it's mm -hmm. blowing these uh, aluminum oxide crystals onto the skin that's sort of abrasive, and then there's a vacuum sucking up those crystals mm -hmm. right back again, and then whatever the skin cells is sort of uh, exactly. dislodging or, or Almost like a sandblasting it is of sandblasting. the skin. Okay. And so as we see on here, we're getting to the stratum corneum. Can we go deeper with microdermabrasion, or do we go deeper? Well, there are devices um, that you can go deeper. Um, should we, then that's a whole other question. Well, licensing would be an issue, right? If you're an esthetician, most likely you're not going to be going below the stratum corneum for this procedure. Um, and I think the purpose of the procedure is to, to, to take the stratum corneum off, not necessarily get down to those other layers. No. Can, it, can that be done, or is it done by mistake? Yes, yeah, so we've probably seen what that looks like, yeah? It, yeah, I mean, I, the first machine I worked with at my doc's office was a pretty heavy-duty machine, and you could get pretty deep in it, but um, it's not something necessarily you would want to do. Okay. So what are the indications for uh, microdermabrasion? Well, what would you use it for? Um, I would use it for a, an exfoliation of the skin. Um, back when I first started in this industry, if we were working on melasma, the um, procedure or the protocol for melasma was to use a product with hydroquinone and um, glycolic acid um, as a topical and then once a month do microdermabrasion to help lift those skin cells off. 
Okay. So um, sun damage, um, otherwise known as photo damage. Um, it's complexion. Some people like to use it for acne scarring, but I don't think it works really well with that. It'd have to be pretty... Uh, It'd have to, you'd have to go deeper than the stratum corneum. Because, you know, if it was acne scarring that lasted longer than, let's say, 40 days, why do we know that this is probably not going to work? Let's because just it use, starts in the dermis. Or, or if, it, if it's in the lower layers of the epidermis, right, it would exfoliate, right? Because in skin cell turnover, if, the, if somehow those layers that were involved in the, the blemish we're talking about were, was located in the epidermis, over time, that eventually that would exfoliate off. So the fact that it still remains would tell you that it's below that. And since microdermabrasion is typically not done below the epidermis or the, even the stratum corneum layer, how much efficacy could it have on something much lower than that? Yeah, that's where, I mean, that if you were trying to get lower than that, then that would be more of a dermabrasion as opposed to microdermabrasion, and right. that would be more of a medical procedure. Right, then you'd probably get numb, go to a, mm -hmm. see a dermatologist or a doc, and then they'd mm -hmm. probably you know, they'd be taking off the entire... Uh, exactly. with the much, epidermis. Yeah, <laughs> with, with much more uh, uh, harsher or, mm -hmm. or uh, powerful substrates and, and chemicals, right? Okay. Um, we're going to show you just a quick histology slide. Basically, what we're showing is that before microdermabrasion, you can see the stratum corneum is a fairly thick layer on the top. And then afterwards, you see that it's been removed. Now, depending on how long you hold the, the, the wand, if you will, mm -hmm. over an area is how much it takes off, right? Mm -hmm. So the slower you go and the, the, the longer you keep it on a particular area, it's having more effect because more particles are coming in contact for longer periods of time. The faster you go, the less effect it has. And yeah. we're going to see that when we do the treatment, yeah? And you can also usually adjust the vacuum and also the amount of crystals that are being um, pushed out. Gotcha. Okay. How about contraindications? Time, things we should not uh, do microdermabrasion on if they have a certain things. Uh, the two biggest ones that I think of as um, rosacea. Let me say um, active rosacea? Yeah, active rosacea. So okay. because especially with a machine with vacuum, pulling on the skin like that isn't really good for it. Okay. Um, and, and usually people with active rosacea have very, very dry skin. And then um, active acne. So we don't want to take bacteria from one lesion and move it over to another area of the skin. So those are like the biggest ones. But then any type of skin conditions, where it could be eczema or psoriasis, um, people who have our prone to cold sores would probably need to be on an antiviral a couple of days ahead of time and a couple of days afterwards because this could activate the um, herpes virus depending on how deep that they're going. Um, but anybody with you know skin lesions or any open lesions or things like that, you want to stay away from. And the obvious ones, if someone's got dermatitis or eczema, psoriasis on their skin, we would not want to no. uh, get just involved with... It. Yeah, we're just we're not going to exfoliate something that has some sort of disease process involved with that. Uh, same with like lupus um, and things like that. So um, I think most of what we're going to see, what you talked about, was the active acne and the active rosacea. Mm -hmm. Those would be the ones, the, the bugaboos, if you will, mm -hmm. not to do that. Um, Let's talk about the research. This is some of the interesting part. We have, I have four different research articles, and basically, um, it's not um, it's not difficult to show that it works. Let's put it that way. There's quite a bit of research. Uh, most of the research has been peer reviewed. There's pretty good research done by uh, people who don't have a are not trying to sell you a, a product or a machine, and they're basically talking uh, about how it works. They're basically, uh, as you described, um, there's two different ways you can uh, blow some aluminum oxide or some other sort of uh, abrasive sand grit on the skin and the vacuum sucks it back up and then it removes uh, a portion of the uh, stratum corneum. Um, in this particular one, it's, this used some uh, hist histopathological study. So it looked at the histology and you saw that slide I showed you. Under a microscope, what does it look like? Mm -hmm. uh, in another study, um, they talked about uh, using a little bit different uh, crystals and what was the difference between using salt Mm -hmm. and using uh, aluminum oxide. And I know you mentioned hydrofacial. That's a little bit different. That's mm -hmm. using salt, but using it with water mm -hmm. involved. So that sort of the same process, but I don't think we're necessarily going to classify it as microdermabrasion uh, as described in, the, in this research. This is a dry uh, powder chemical, not any water. And you would have to say that the water would have a, its own effect on mm -hmm. the skin. Have you ever had hydrofacial done? I have. What do you think of that as far as the feeling of it? Well, it felt really good. Um, I didn't see a big difference in my skin afterwards, but I thought that it felt wonderful. Um, but as for any type of 
like a clinical difference. I didn't notice that, but um, clients like it. So it's always, you know, not a bad idea to have something that clients like to do. I mean, at my place, most of the things that I do hurt. Um, so sometimes it's kind of nice to have something that's a little bit more fluffy. When you compare the hydrofacial to, uh, say, like the aluminum oxide uh, microdermabrasion, did you felt they were similar as far as the effect? Did you tell one was more aggressive? What did you think? I think the, the aluminum oxide crystals um, did a little bit more of exfoliation. Okay. But I like the feel of the hydrofacial. It felt more hydrating. Okay. Um, I know we're talking about research, but when we're talking about the price of these machines, um, and then how much you can charge a client for these. What's in, in our area here, we're in Scottsdale, how much did, would it take to buy a, a microdermabrasion machine uh, a, using aluminum oxide versus how much is a hydrofacial, just generally? Uh, we're talking new? Yeah, we'll just use new. Okay, so new, probably aluminum oxide is going to be around seven to $10,000. Hydrofacial is going to be probably seventeen to twenty. How about a used one, just for example? It could be aluminum oxide um, would probably be about 3500 um, and then a hydrofacial probably in the lower teens. Okay. Now, how much can you charge for one of these sessions? If it's just a standalone treatment, it's usually about $125 to maybe $150, depending on the area you're in. So not too bad of a return on investment. I assume you'd be using it on quite a few patients because mm -hmm. there's not that many contraindications. The machine is less than at, the, at its top end, 17000 So. Um, you know, in say a matter of a, maybe a couple of years, you can get your money back. If you got bought one used, you'd probably get it back in you know eight nine months. Mm -hmm. And do you feel like that'd be something that's a, a, a worthwhile investment as far as if you had to choose a machine and you were sticking to what uh, what you could do under your esthetician license, not working under the license of a, of a medical director? Do you think this is a machine that that would be a, a good purchase for what it does? Personally, personally, yeah. Well, um, your your opinion of how you you run your practice. Do you think would you buy one? I do a dermaplaning. Okay. Um, because I like getting rid of the vellus hair too. Um, so you're saying with dermaplaning, not only can you take off that stratum corneum layer, but you're also taking off the vellus hair. Yeah. Can you charge about the same for it? I charge a hundred dollars to probably a hundred and twenty. Um, but my cost per treatment is less. How much time does it take to do the dermaplaning versus the microdermabrasion using, say, the aluminum oxide machine? Well, it depends on the person. Um, you, you know, though, it, it takes me about 15 minutes to dermaplane somebody's face okay. and probably a little bit, probably about 10 minutes um, to do microderm, depending on how many passes I make. So similar. Okay. Let's use this last research article, and then we'll, we'll get to the. Tr we'll show the actual treatment here. This last article here, which is interesting, it's it's talking about the recovery of the skin barrier after stratum corneal removal by microdermabrasion. But what I like about this article is it compares dermaplaning, microdermabrasion, and microneedling to show how 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 soon after you do something like that does the skin return back to normal. And what they're showing is in microdermabrasion, you have a 12-hour window when your absorption of some sort of topical product can be enhanced. And after 12 hours, um, this was done on guinea pigs, but they were able to use the, some of the, the science and apply it to human skin by looking at the differences between human skin and guinea pig skin. And what they did find is, is that the human skin had a little bit, um, it took a little bit longer, so it was around the 14-hour mark. But they also showed the different times that the, the uh, Micro channels stayed open, and how much uh, it took for uh, water uh, to T E W L. Explain that for us. You tool. Do that. Tool. Real quick. Which I love because I live in Scottsdale. And I think uh, they're a looking at tool measurements. Yes, if you it's transepidermal water loss. Very good. So, how Thank much you. water are you going to lose? So, that's how they were measuring whether the skin got back to normal. So, what was cool about this is they're showing that uh, if you're trying to get a, a product uh, through the skin by doing the microdermabrasion ahead of time, you have, it, it really helped with letting the product go through quite a bit more. And in, in similarly, when we do things like dermaplaning, had that same effect. And microneedling had a more pronounced effect than that. Um, but it's a, this, what's nice about this particular research article is that the whole article's there. So I invite you to check it out on your own. Uh, the link's there and you can check it out. Uh, we're now going to go do the procedure on me, which I already did, but now through the magic of things, we're going to show you how, what's going on. What machine are we, are we using? Do you remember? Is it Dermagenesis? Is I think it's Dermagenesis, okay. yeah. Uh, okay, so we will see you when we return from doing the treatment on me.
So what I'm doing is microdermabrasion, and this device uses aluminum oxide crystals, so and also a vacuum. So what it's doing is it's blowing the aluminum oxide crystals onto the skin, much like a sandblaster, and then the vacuum is removing the crystals back up off of the skin. And if you notice, when I get to the end of my row, and I'm overlapping probably about 15%, you can kind of see my hand flick sideways. And what I'm doing is I'm breaking that vacuum seal. One of the problems that people do are, have when they do microdermabrasion is if they don't tilt it sideways and break that seal, then sometimes it pulls on the skin and it gives them kind of like a little hickey. So when you're using one of the devices with um, or a machine with um, a vacuum seal, you want to make sure that you tilt the hand piece just a little bit to allow some of that air in so you can remove it um, safely off the skin without giving them a hickey. Um, I'm going to go over both sides of the forehead and what this is doing is creating an exfoliation of the skin. Um, so it'll allow products to penetrate in a little bit more. It'll also take off some of the stratum corneum. So you're going to have kind of a brighter, fresher looking skin. You can do microdermabrasion on pretty much every part of the body. Sometimes people will do it um, on the neck or they'll do it on the decollete. Some people do it on the back, especially if somebody's had acne or acne scarring, um, they'll use it on the back. Now in with scarring, it's not really going to do a lot. It was for very superficial things because again, we're dealing with the top of the stratum cornea and we're not dealing with the dermis where some of that scarring um, originates. Um, I will always adjust my pressure of the vacuum and also my aluminum oxide crystals to the comfort of the client. Each client is going to have a little bit different skin. So you may have to use a little bit different vacuum uh, pressure. Um, if somebody has a lot of broken capillaries on the side of the nostrils, so the alar vessels, I would probably avoid the nose um, just because that vacuum can um, kind of tug on the skin a little bit and can possibly cause uh, broken vessels. I'm going to stay up in the areas on his face where he doesn't have his facial hair, but if the person has shaved um, recently, then obviously you can go right over the um, area where there's facial hair too. And then I'd like to give a little bit of love right in between the eyebrows and the gabella, um, just because he's got a little bit of dry skin in the area. So I went back over that. Now, when I finish with um, the microdermabrasion, I will either do a um, uh, some type of a serum, maybe a ceramide serum. You could also do a mask, something that's going to replace the moisture that you were just exfoliating. Hi, welcome back to the Evidence-Based Esthetician. And um, again, I'm Chris Group. This is Dr. Larry Group, and happy to be back with you. Um, on the last episode, we were talking about multi-level marketing and how it applies to skincare. And should it be part of skincare? Should it not be part of skincare? And several of you wrote in to talk about two specific companies. And so we want to address those two companies today. And by the way, we don't condone, we don't endorse these companies. Um, what we're here is to produce the evidence with these companies and let you make up your own mind. Yeah, I mean, we're not criticizing them either. We just went on a line, did this much, finding as much information on these two companies as we can and kind of present that and get an idea. Is this a good thing for estheticians and clients or is it a bad thing or a neutral? Uh, we give you the information, let you make up your own mind. But uh, here's what we found. We're going to start with Nerium. Um, and I went to their website to get their information. And um, here's basically the Nerium folks have patented and extracted what they call the N. AE-8 extract, which is a oleander uh, derivative from the oleander plant. Uh, if you want to know anything about oleander, um, it, it's basically used a lot in, in uh, cancer treatment. It's also, it was used as a poison for many, many years. Uh, Chris, from the site, what, did, what do you see that they're talking about it doing? Um, well, it's, it's, it says, so I'm going to talk about what it actually says on their site, um, that it addresses the signs of aging. Um, as well as the underlying causes, which right there would cause me 
to pause and take a deeper look at what are the underlying causes and what are the signs of aging. Um, because they can be classified as either a cosmetic or a drug, but this product can't be both, according to the FDA. Yeah, when we looked at, you know, in another episode, we'll talk about what the FDA, how they classify things. It can either be one thing or the other. A, a cosmetic, which is done, uh, which is defined as uh, an article that's designed to beautify the skin and enhance appearance, or a drug, things that have some sort of uh, physiological effect on a uh, biological system. Um, or is intended to do so. In this particular case, if they're actually saying it's going to address the underlying causes of aging, that's far more than beautifying. So uh, we won't get into whether or not that's a classification of drug or cosmetic, but I'd have to say that when you're making claims about physiological function, you'd have to have a couple things. You'd have to have a molecule that has the ability to get past the stratum corneum, to pass the epidermis down to the dermis where you know, living cells are, the basal keratinocyte layer of the epidermis, and of course the dermis, and then you'd have to have some sort of mechanism of action. What does it bind to? What does it influence? And how does it work? Uh, what else does it say it does? Um, it also says that it's a very powerful antioxidant um, that helps to target free radical activity. Um, and so we know there's lots of antioxidants out in the market. I don't know whether this is or it isn't, but we're going to take a look at that. And then the other thing it talks about is it boosts the cell renewal process to reveal younger looking skin. So I don't know if that means that it's going to um, increase the cell turnover like a vitamin A would, or if it's, uh, we all know that when you put something on the skin and it causes inflammation, which oleander does cause inflammation, um, that you get edema on the skin. And once that skin goes back down to its baseline, then you are going to get some exfoliation, just like if you had a pimple and it expands the skin. Um, and when it comes back down, it always exfoliates off. So we're going to take a look at that also. Yeah, we look at things that a term like to reveal younger looking skin, that's a pretty uh, uh, lawyer tested marketing term that basically strat straddles that line of from the FDA saying uh, the appearance of something. So we're revealing younger looking skin. We're not saying it's younger. But when we talk about boost the cell renewal process, is that is that the shedding of cells, is that exfoliation, or is that actually uh, you know increasing sk skin cell turnover like a vitamin A would? So uh, we don't know, but that's what it says. So let's take a look. Here's uh, some of their products. So they have what do they have, Chris? They have, they have a, a night cream, which is, I believe, what they started with, and then they added in a day cream, and then also a firming body contour cream. And they're all age-defying, which that's not necessarily good or bad. I assume that it depends on what age you're trying to defy. Okay? <laughs> I'm defying all of them. Yes, I defy them all. So um, at the very bottom, this is a common statement you'll see on on. Uh, marketing uh, websites that are doing products, it'll say, it says, these statements have not been evaluated by the FDA. This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. So That's we're, pretty much we're a basically what, what a disclaimer saying that it really isn't a drug and it isn't designed to do any of the things that may be saying that it's designed to do. So let's go to the next one. And to be fair, Almost every uh, company that's marketing a product out there has, gonna have that puts FDA that statement out there. So it does not necessarily mean it's a good or bad product, that it works or does not work. They're just trying to comply with the FDA, which is often confusing to both uh, companies marketing products and the, the public out there who has no idea what the FDA is talking about most of the time. Let's see, we need the next slide. So I went and did a look for the uh, ingredients. So here's what I found for Nurium AD ingredients. Uh, we have the NAE-8 trademarked uh, and uh, apparently patented proprietary blend, which means proprietary means uh, we don't want to tell you what's in it. Exactly. <laughs> so Sometimes we, I don't think they know what's in it. It's yeah, well, or if it is, it's so proprietary that they, they don't yeah, even know. know. Uh, basically, it has aloe, leaf liquid, and nerium oleander leaf. And then it has some other different leaf liquids. Another proprietary protein, which is plant-derived, known as plant-derived, Collagen, elastin, and glycosamine, the glycans. Um, anybody think that if you eat jello and gelatin that your nails get better? Remember that myth that somehow by consuming collagen or elastin, it somehow it gets through your tummy, doesn't get broken down, gets put back out into the skin and magically binds to your nails or skin to make it healthier, uh, which would go against all science that says that collagen and elastin are laid down by fibroblasts. 
um, specific patterns um, and specifically linked to certain structures. So uh, consuming or put, topically putting on a collagen or elastin doesn't necessarily mean that that stuff's ever going to bind or do anything. Um, and in another episode that we're going to get to, the size of the molecule has a lot to do with whether or not it ever makes it through the epidermis. So does anyone think that a collagen molecule, which is a pretty big molecule, is going to ever make it through the epidermis without some sort of help? Probably not. What else do you see as far as ingredients? Um, there's some know? different, um, there's like a tocopherol, which is a vitamin E. They've got fragrance in it. They've got some different alcohols, um, some different things that are going to be dryers. They've got dimethicone, which is going to provide slip onto the skin, right. um, a wheat protein, but there's lots of vegetable oil. I, I, it's, I don't see that in a lot of skincare products. Yeah, vegetable oil is an interesting one. There has to be some sort of oil base to make it have some substantivity to stick around on your skin. So, okay, so there's what's in it. So we can kind of say that we talked about what they list as their ingredients. Um, what is a molecular weight? It is 576 <clears throat> Daltons, and I put my uh, source up there. In another episode, we're going to show that anything over 500 Daltons has been shown to have not get through the epidermis without some sort of enhancement technique. So the fact that this is 76 Daltons bigger than the biggest molecule that can make it through would lead us to believe that without some sort of enhancement efforts, either by an additive or by some technique, this molecule is not making it past the epidermis. Um, so here's their science and research. This is right from their site. Uh, they basically said they've done some clin clinical trials and they've done some, their clinical testing philosophy involves the use of third party testing facilities. Okay. So I did not see any listing of any scientific article or uh, links to an article. I just see this on their page and a uh, statement of what it is without really saying who did the research or, um, you know, where was it published. So I went ahead and got into PubMed and Google Scholar, which we can show you how to get into Google Scholar too. You know, one of the things I would say about this page, it's very pretty. Yeah. It's very well done. And if you don't know what you're looking for, it shows clinical trials, the testing philosophy, and also safety. So you might look at this and go, oh, they've got clinical they've got trials. Clinical trials so we're because good. It, it says so on there. So at Evidence Based Esthetician, we don't take anybody's word for word anything. For anything. Well, okay, so let's see it. Find out. Yeah, show me the money. <laughs> okay. So this is the only one I could find uh, specifically on NAE8. Uh, it was published in National Institute of Health. Uh, in a, in a, the, uh, you'll see the, the citation up there. You can type this in and the article will come up. Um, what's nice about this particular article is the entire article was actually listed in uh, Google Scholar. A lot of times they just give you the abstract. Um, and this was an, uh, an in, a, a, uh, in vitro study, which means it was not done on live humans. It was done sort of a test tube type study. And in this, they had taken their NAE8 -A 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 molecule and uh, put it in contact with different uh, dermal fibroblasts and things like that to see what sort of activity it had. Um, what I think the most interesting thing about this study and what we should always be looking for when we look at the, for the quality of the research article is <coughs> who funded it and who did it, okay? So when we look at the bottom, I've highlighted this in blue, when we look at acknowledgements, it was done by Nerium themselves in their own facility. So that, that doesn't necessarily mean the research is bad, but that sort of takes a chunk out of the credibility. And if, if the only research out there is being done by the company selling it, you almost have to say to yourself, okay, is that really unbiased? Is that really objective? Is there anybody else looking at this and saying, is this true or not true? Has anyone else tested this? Now, that does, just because I couldn't find it doesn't mean that doesn't exist. There is lots of research um, talking about oleander in cancer uh, fighting and different types of uh, um, cytotoxicity studies and the fact that it acts as a poison and how dangerous it is. Um, but there's no other study that I could find looking doing the research besides this one here. And in the end, they're trying to show that by uh, putting this molecule in, in proximity to dermal fibroblasts that somehow made the dermal fibroblasts uh, less inflammatory, uh, more likely to uh, produce collagen and elastin. Again, an in vitro study, so not a living animal study, and only uh, one study that we could find. So one study done by the company that makes it tends to fall really low. That gets like a D minus on my research ometer as far as whether or not something's good or not. It's, it exists there and it's something you can, at least has research, but sadly it's done by the company. So 
that's uh, my report on the research piece of it. I think the next thing to talk about is the, uh, you know, how is it marketed in the money part? Chris, what's your thoughts on MLM? Well, here's, here's the thing, and, and because we have a school and because we have a med spa, we have been approached by lots and lots of people who come in and want us to sell their products. Um, and what it comes down to is it, what they call an opportunity. Um, it's a financial opportunity. It's not what I would consider a skincare opportunity. Skincare is the, the conduit in the sales of it or signing people up to sell it and be consultants for it is what this is all about. It's about making money or the potential to make money. It's not about the skincare. Okay, so let's take a look at what the opportunity <clears throat> is. So what they basically say the opportunity is, is that we don't know whether or not you have to have a background in skincare or you have to be a doctor, do you have to be an esthetician to be able to sell uh, Nerium or not. But when we look on their site, basically anyone can do it. So we went on their site and looked at their testimonials of people who have taken the opportunity and ran with it and done fantastic with it. So let's take a look at one of those. I didn't know anything about Nerium when I first started. I, in fact, I was one of those people that barely washed her face before she went to bed. So I really didn't know anything about skincare. My friend brought the information to me and showed me the opportunity. So I jumped in and with Nerium, they just give you so much more between the financial aspect, but all of the people that you meet, the support, the whole culture itself, I think, has changed me. 19 months now I've been with Nerium and my life has just completely changed, not only financially, but overall with how I make decisions for the family. The culture with Nerium just makes everyone feel like family. Everyone's happy and everyone's willing to help each other and support each other and succeed. In my first 30 days, I, I rank advanced and I earn my iPad. And then within my next month and a half after that is when I earn my Lexus. Okay, so we saw the video with the, with the gal that basically said she has no background in skincare, didn't even wash her face at night, but within a month was able to, uh, to become... Get an a, iPad. Get an iPad, and Another month. a couple months later she has a Lexus. So uh, is that a good thing for uh, the client, and is that a good thing for uh, an esthetician? Because there's so much money to be made, apparently based on this, should we be possibly selling uh, skincare uh, products through MLM in our clinics? Um, well, one of the things that was on their opportunity page was um, get paid to do what you love. Um, what I love is skincare. And instead of getting paid through an MLM, I actually went to school for it. Um, so I paid a school <laughs> to get to do what I love. And you're licensed. And well, I'm licensed. Basically says you went through X amount of time to learn how to do something. Exactly. Is there any licensing that you could see for uh, no. Miriam? Did you have to have some, take a test? Um, I haven't seen anything, and what's interesting is I've had a couple of friends who are licensed estheticians and actually aesthetic instructors who try to get me to go to, you know, I have to possibly, I, I, I have to go to this event, I have to go listen to these people speak, which my years go up as I know what it is, it's an MLM. And they were doing it though because I knew that they were financially having problems. Um, so they looked at this as an opportunity to make money while still taking care of skin. And on both opportunities, both of them stopped doing it within a couple of months. Um, so I think that the company probably that made the money was near them because they got their initial investment. So you're saying that basically the money being made from the way that the plan is laid out is not so much by selling a product yourself, <clears throat> but by signing up other people to become distributors. And then, of course, the pyramid builds and they sign people up and they sign people up. And in the end, all of these people, you're making a commission or a percentage of all the, all the people's sales that sign up. Um, it's a, yes, it's, so, it's about the consultants. It's not about the skincare. So is this just the way that Nerium works, or is this the way all MLM works? Or is there, you know, we had talked about another company. Um, was it Rodan and Fields? Yeah, it was Rodan and Fields, um, and their big push is it was founded by two um, Stanford dermatologists. So that adds some credibility to the products because dermatologists created it. But when you look at um, their marketing material that they put out, and they put out the, the pattern to prosperity, not one part of it talks about skincare. It talks about sales, leadership qualities, 
and how many people do you need to sign up to make X amount of dollars. So it all comes back to the consultants because if you sign up with these companies, you have to buy an initial kit and that can go up to $1,000 for your kit. So if you sign up 10 people, then that's $10,000 and 10 people in your downline. So when I look at skincare, I, I want to know what is the skincare about. I don't want to know how many people do I have to sign up. Or you want to know, does the product work and does my client get some sort of benefit if I do this, give them this particular product? Mm -hmm. In this particular instance, there's no real, whether or not the product works or not, really isn't that talked about as their pattern to prosperity. There's no mention whether or not you even know anything about skincare or whether or not the product works for the client or not. It's all about how many people you can sign up. They have a chart here on their pattern to prosperity. I took this from the Rodan and Fields and their uh, foundation site. for financial freedom. On month four, assuming you uh, everything goes as according to this, is you can sign up uh, for people that will have a, a total of 1,632 other people sign up and you'll make uh, $46,000, something like that. Now, what's interesting about MLMs and something we should all know is that the federal government and the Federal Trade Commission require them to issue a, what's called a, uh, a financial income statement or how much money you can actually make or how much money was actually made by their consultants. And we've, we found Rodan and Fields for 2014. Let's take a look at that. Okay, so the 2004 income disclosure statement, and then I assume Nerium will have this and Amway and all that. It basically says that the average consultant, the average commission or the average annualized income, so I mean the amount of money they made in a year in 2014 was $2,881. So that's the average money that's, that the average consultant for Rodana Fields made in a year. Um, and if we look at how they averaged that, we have 0.1% of the, of the consultants made, uh, looks like $1.6 million, but 25% of them made, uh, looks like about five, their high was $5,000 or an average was $769. So it's five thousand dollars for the year, the not year, for a month. So basically, year. you're talking about six hundred bucks a month, right? Um, so I think what we're showing here that very, very few uh, people less make. Than that. Well, we'll say one percent of the of the people that are are uh, Rodan and Field uh, associates or distributors make uh, fifty eight thousand dollars or more. Only one percent. Um, only twenty five percent can get to five thousand dollars. Everybody else, the other seventy five or I can say about 70%, 60% uh, make under that. So the chances of you making enough money to live on, let's say the average uh, to live on would be what, maybe $40,000 a year. Um, the chances of you doing that is about 3% of the time. So that's, that's almost, you know, that's not quite the lottery, but I think I would rather focus on providing good skincare to clients that have a mechanism of action and research behind it so that it works and they refer people than rely on how many people I can sign up and hope that those people don't quit, quit and sign up other people. Uh, well, well, I look at this like if, if these were, and, and these are the numbers because they came from the actual company, um, I'm not going to quit my day job. Um, because my day job is working as a skincare professional and I make a lot more money doing that. Um, and, and one of the things that we talked about is how does this affect a skincare professional? So somebody who is licensed, who has gone to school um, for this profession, how does an MLM affect us? And one, uh, most of us aren't going to sell it because we can see kind of the smoke and mirrors and, and it's, it's all about signing up consultants. I didn't start to become an esthetician um, to sign up consultants. I wanted to work with clients. That's what right. my focus is. And if people want to do this, I mean, it's their prerogative. They can do what they want to do. It's, it's you know, we live in America, so it's a pretty free country. Um, but but, do, you, do you think it's hurting or helping estheticians who went to school and are trying to deliver both products and, and treatments that actually have science behind them to have this competing out there with all these marketing dollars and an army of, of housewives and folks who want to make money um, selling a product with no training? I, I, well, I, I, I know I'm supposed to be unbiased, but I'm a little biased because um, I think it hurts our industry. Um, it's, it's not a product that, you know, when I went to help a um, student of mine um, do an evening with um, talking about lasers. And one of the, you know, questions came up on skincare and we talked about what ingredients are important in skincare. And one of the ladies there was like, oh, I don't want to hear about it because I'm an RNF um, consultant. 
and I'm like, okay, well, that's good hey, for you. You actually don't want to they hear don't about want the They don't want to hear might, about the science. You might tell them that the something doesn't it's work. It's like, okay, you don't want to hear about the science. That's cool. Um, but when it comes to my clients, I want to be able to give them um, products that I know have science behind them or that I know are going to be beneficial for them because I'm growing my business on a referral basis. Exactly. So that's how I want to approach this business. Um, this company has a lot of dollars out there um, in marketing and you can see these products on Amazon, you can see them on other places, you can see them all over the place on Facebook. Um, and they, they're a very aggressive group of people because they know that they're going to make their money by signing up consultants, not by selling skincare. Yep. So, I look at it as it kind of does my my industry a disservice because I have a lot of people out there pushing skincare that don't know anything about the skin. Um, so it's kind of how it can be skincare if you don't know anything about the skin as exactly. far as consultant care. Exactly. Well, that's all the time we have for this episode of Evidence-Based Esthetician. Thanks for joining us and looking at both microdermabrasion and looking at multi-level marketing. Um, we will see you in two weeks for our next episode. Thank you much. Brought to you by the letter. Yeah.